Welcome to today's webinar, Receiver Design for the Future, brought to you by GPS World and by our sponsor, NAPCOM. I'm Allison Barwatch from North Coast Media, Digital Editor for GPS World Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available one day from today on our website, dpsworld.com slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice that in the lower left-hand corner of your console, there is a Submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in the line. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of GPS World Magazine or in one of our weekly e-newsletters, GPS World Navigate. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. In addition to this, there is a PDF of the webinar slides in the bottom left-hand corner of your console. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Diane Safranek or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, GPS World Editor Alan Cameron. Hi everyone, this is Alan Cameron. Thank you, Allison. Uh, and uh, welcome to everyone out there in webland. Welcome to this webinar about receiver design for the future. And I'd like to first acknowledge our sponsor and give thanks to NAVCOM, a John Deere company, sponsoring the entire uh, series of webinars in 2015. Uh, today's topic, as I said, is receiver design for the future. Challenges and Opportunities of Enabling All-Day, Everywhere, Location for All Mobile Platforms. And our presenter, whom you'll hear from in just a few moments, is Greg Turetsky. Greg is a principal engineer at Intel. He first burst upon the scene, or perhaps into my awareness, uh, long time at Surf Technology, a pioneering GPS company back in the uh, 90s and early part of, of this century. Uh, Greg then went to CSR for a period and is now with Intel. Uh, he just told me he's uh, recently been elected Western Regional Vice President for ION, the U.S. Institute of Navigation, so that adds to his resume. The presentation that you are going to hear today was first made at the Stanford P&T Symposium in December. The Stanford P&T Symposium is a very high-level event. It's invitation only. Uh, to tell you how exclusive it is, I wasn't even invited. So this is my first time to see this presentation, although I'm, of course, familiar with it. Uh, we are presenting the exact same uh, event from the Stanford P&T Symposium for you today. Uh, we do have, we've had a bit of reporting on Greg's presentation. That uh, was how I first learned of it. Uh, I excerpted a little bit of that in my January editorial column, and there will be further, more lengthy reporting on it in the February issue, uh, reporting done by Jim Litton and Tom Langenstein. Uh, but here you, uh, our select audience of webinar attendees, are going to get the full thing straight and unadulterated. I'm going to turn it over to Greg in just a second. I will be back at the conclusion of his presentation which will probably last about 30 minutes. We'll have another half hour to answer your questions. I've been reviewing the questions that you all submitted when you signed up for the webinar. We've got an impressive list of questions. Uh, we'll have no trouble at all filling up another half hour. And you are encouraged also to submit questions that occur to you during the presentation. You can do so, as Allison mentioned, via the button at the bottom of your console. And we will be taking live, uh, live in quotes, questions, as well as the pre-submitted ones. Now I'm going to turn it over to Greg Tureski. Greg, take it away. 
Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, I guess I'm I'm pretty much just gonna jump right in since we've had enough of a enough of an introduction here. Um, so um, I really appreciate being able to uh, uh, push this information out to a larger group of people. It um, it was well received at Stanford, and um, it'll be uh, it's a good opportunity to um, to bring this information out to a larger audience. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, um, Intel's presence in the mobile business. It's probably not something uh, people are aware of. I know when I first went to Intel, people were wondering why I was there. Um, but from there, we'll talk about um, kind of the, the market backup for, um, for why what's going on in the GNSS market for, cons for the consumer. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about consumer-level mobile um, applications, since that's our um, primary, primary place. Then we'll talk a little bit about the impact of indoor location um, in terms of how it's impacting um, the, the design and the, uh, um, w the requirements for products, and then talk um, a little bit about kind of the, system, the GNSS system architecture and its impact um, on that, and then um, I'll give you a little bit of an insight into uh, how a company like Intel, which is in, uh, mostly in the silicon business, um, looks at the impact of advanced silicon technology on um, the uh, development of these kind of receivers. So, um, so Intel's mission, in case you you don't know, is um, no longer just to build PCs. Um, that's uh, that's not our um, that's not our main goal anymore. Um, we're uh, about bringing smart connected devices to everyone. So um, that that encompasses a pretty wide range of products, um, and we've been expanding our portfolio appropriately. Um, and so, so the mantra of the group that I'm in, which is um, the, uh, what's called WCS, or the Wireless Connectivity Systems, um, oh, is, is um, to kind of help um, Intel bring about um, the connected part um, of Intel's vision, which is if it's smart and connected, it's best with Intel. So we start with Everything from, on the left-hand side, the uh, big iron data center things, which are part of smart devices, down to mobile clients, um, and then all the way into the um, IoT and wearables type of, of devices. All of those devices are now um, considered part of this smart connected world, um, and they are all targets for, um, for Intel solutions going forward. So again, our group's job is mostly to, to help on the connectivity side which varies um, with, with these different um, products. Um, you might not think of Intel as being in this uh, connected product business, but we actually are. Um, and there are a lot of them out there on the market today. Um, some of the more notable ones um, uh, are shown on this slide. Um, my personal favorite um, is, in, is in the upper right-hand corner. Um, called the uh, a, uh, from Asus, it's uh, the PadPhone X Mini, which basically has a um, an LTE handset that plugs into the back of a seven-inch tablet. So it's a combo device that allows you to remove the phone um, separately when you don't want to be in tablet mode. Um, so Intel is penetrating into a lot of these um, different markets, um, and you're going to see a lot more phones and tablets. Um, coming your way from Intel, you should have seen um, probably saw a bunch of them over uh, over the holiday season. There were a number of um, introductions of devices um, in Best Buy and other places, so that Intel's presence in this market um, is growing growing rapidly. Um, and then you know this whole um, this whole idea extends beyond just mobile phones and into Internet of Things, right? Um, and if any of you were at CES this year, I'm sure you saw that this was. Um, this is a big trend in what's going on. Um, and the Internet of Things methodology of transforming business um, by, by looking at connectivity from sensors all the way out to big data to make, to make interesting decisions and um, whatnot is, is really a trend that's going on. And the number of products and proliferations that are happening is, is, is quite unbelievable. Um, the number of devices that are becoming connected to the Internet is, is growing um, faster than anybody can kind of keep up with, um, and that creates a really interesting opportunity. So, um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of a background of why Intel is interested in this market and kind of where you're going to see us 
playing. And so I want to get back to something that's a little kind of closer to heart, which is, so what's kind of the market basis for um, for continuing in this market? Because a lot of people have the opinion that, that the GNSS market is kind of flat. Um, we've looked at a number of different market studies. This one in particular came out of the, um, the GSA report. Um, that would kind of indicate that it's not nearly as flat as you would think. Um, the, uh, the growth rate certainly is slowing, but any market that continues to grow, um, as shown here, at a 9% annual growth rate is a very nice growth target area. And as you can see from this slide, the, uh, the expectation is that we're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 billion devices um, within the next you know, 8 to 10 years. Um, so we've, um, we're getting to the point where we're exceeding the number of GNSS receivers is exceeding the population of the planet, um, which makes for an interesting um, thought process about where GNSS um, is going to end up and, and how it's going to have to uh, end up in everything that we do. So we see, um, we see a nice market opportunity for that. A big reason for that is, um, as you know, we've seen a lot of growth in this kind of multi-constellation for GNSS. So uh, everything pretty much has GPS in it that anybody terms as GNSS, but the growth of these other constellations is happening relatively quickly. Um, this slide, in my opinion, is already significantly out of date, um, even though it's less than a year old. Um, our estimates would indicate that the, you know, the GLONASS penetration into um, receivers, especially in the mo mobile field, is closer to 70 or 80 percent today. Um, and we expect that to continue to grow. There's really no reason why um, GNSS receivers can't support multiple constellations um, at the consumer mobile level. Um, and then once those constellations are all in place, then you know we look at where those receivers are going from a market segment standpoint. Um, and this particular slide is divided by revenue, um, which is an interesting way to do it because we all we all know that if you divided it by actual units, that the um, the LBS portion in um, in phones would just dominate everything. Uh, everything else would be a sliver that that wouldn't even be visible. But but if you look at it from a revenue standpoint, there's there's still very large revenue opportunities um, in in both the phone segment and in the um, automotive segment. So so it's not purely a phone methodology. Um, and if you look at this particular this particular slide, what you'll notice is this Internet of Things category doesn't even show up here. Um, and that's another thing that I think we'll see as a trend going forward, is there'll be a new slice of the pie that starts to show up going forward, which is focused on Internet of Things and those types of applications. So if we start to look at kind of how are we providing this location capability beyond just GNSS, and say, well, how are people determining their location in these different platforms, and what are the different technologies that are available? Um, this is, um, this is a, a slide that, that was put out by ABI um, on, their, on their view. And as you can see kind of here in the 2014-2015 timeframe, right, the most popular methodology is still, still GPS, which is what we would all expect. Um, but there's a very fast-growing trend here um, on both Bluetooth-enabled and Wi-Fi-enabled um, penetration of, of, of alternative lo location technologies. So, so although GNSS is continuing to grow with the market growth, um, the growth of other technologies and the ability to incorporate them into a fused location solution is growing pretty quickly. Um, and the radio versions of those are, in general, growing, um, growing the fastest. And, and then followed by the inertial sensors. So clearly, I think what we're going to see going forward is this, this combination of location technologies to provide a, a single answer is going to become the norm in, um, in mobile consumer products. So if we look at where these things are, so now that we've thought about kind of what the technologies are and um, and how they're going to go, we can start to look at how those things might end up in different, um, especially for indoors, different areas. Um, and what you see if you look at this, at this chart that's uh, provided by ABI is that there's, there's a huge um, growth, not only huge growth, but a huge segmentation among a number of different types of venues, all of which seem to be adopting 
uh, an indoor location technology methodology. Not all of them will adopt the same ones, um, but all of these different types of venues are, are looking at that market and are looking at potentially different technologies to, to serve their needs. What, what might be most appropriate in a, in a grocery store, something more um, associated with finding a particular item like a Bluetooth beacon, might be less interesting um, in something like an airport where we're still talking about navigation from place to place where proximity is not necessarily the right, the right answer. But what we see here is a very large growth of a very, uh, a very disparate um, base. And on the top right um, is a pie chart that um, I had to remove the, uh, the labels on the pieces of the pie. But, but what that pie chart was is a list of all the different technology suppliers that are addressing these particular indoor markets. So what you see is a highly fragmented supplier base. Um, that's very um, that's very consistent with an early market implementation. There's a lot of different people attempting to to get into this market with a lot of different solutions. Um, so this is um, this is pretty classic for for early for an early adopter type of scenario. So um, we're going to talk about um, the accuracy requirements changing. Um, in a later, in a, um, in a little bit later in the presentation, well, but once we've looked at where the um, where those where those venues are, we start to look at all the different people who are trying to participate in the ecosystem that's required to do that. And if you start from the bottom, where where I live as a chipset manufacturer, and you move yourself um, up the chain, what you see is that there's there's seven different layers of people who are involved in the creation of a location to an end user, um, especially for indoors. And every single person in this value chain is trying to make money. And that's really the, the, um, the crux of the issue here, is it's not that there's not money to be made, it's that there's a lot of people who want a piece of that pie. Um, and all of them have a relevant uh, part to play but when you have seven different people in the stack and all of them trying to own the location, it becomes very difficult to create um, a, unified, um, a unified methodology to, to address that. So it's a very complex ecosystem, and uh, I live at the bottom in the kind of the technology implementation methodology, and so getting, getting dollars to flow all the way from the top to the bottom by the time it gets down to us is, is relatively difficult. So, um, so our we are very cost driven to bring this capability um, into uh, into this market. So, um, if we look at that in summary, from a market standpoint, what we see is that the, the market opportunity is really big and it's still growing. So it makes it very interesting to a company like Intel, even though we're not in the business today, to get in. We see a trend of growing from GPS to GNSS and now onward to location, and that the new, the new big opportunity is indoor location. But this indoor location is not kind of a standalone opportunity. It's not, um, we're not going to be selling indoor location devices. It's important because it enables this capability inside other devices, inside phones and tablets and IoT type of things. So we're going to, um, to look at that as a feature within a, within a larger portion of a product. Um, and that, that becomes from this idea that these, the requirement comes from the requirement for location so that we can provide context. As these devices are now not just used to make phone calls but are used all the time, then, then the number of applications that are running on them really require that location context to determine what the most likely use case is um, for, for the user to make the consumer experience easier. And we see that going throughout this entire uh, value chain from phones and tablets and wearables. So one of the things that I'd like to touch on lastly, if you think about that from a requirement standpoint, is to look at what's happened to the major places where GNSS has enabled trend changes in the market. So if I kind of walk through this chart horizontally and start out in the early 2000s like uh, Alan was referring to when I was in, in surf, the main volume driver in the market at that time was PNDs, right, was all these um, dashboard-mounted um, PNDs. 
And the main thing we were trying to fix, the main use case, was the urban canyon problem. GPS always worked well in rural areas, but it didn't work well in the urban canyon. In order to fix that, we had to improve the sensitivity. Um, and that came about in about that time frame with multi-correlator designs um, and improved RF front ends that we were able to drop the sensitivity of the receivers by a good 5 to 10 dB, which enabled us really to keep the antennas inside the car so that there was no need for this roof-mounted antenna and a PND could just be mounted on the dash and work just fine. And the secondary specification that enabled that market to, to become um, important was, was time to first fix, right? Those devices had to power up and work, work fast. About, within about five years, however, that market was, was being overtaken by this growth in the feature phone market. And the reason why that was, that was coming about was that the E911 mandate came out and everyone had to figure out a way to make sure that phones um, had the ability to, to meet the 911 mandate. GPS was one of the major methodologies of meeting that. And the main driver there was not really sensitivity, it was around time to first fix. Um, so we had to improve the time to first fix of receivers so that they would be able to meet the 911 mandate, which required a 30 second type of implementation in a very uh, challenged environment, which led us to the development of AGPS um, and further integration into, into phones, we, we had a secondary requirement of increasing the sensitivity because now we had to have an even worse antenna in a handset. Once that was, was taken care of in the, in the mid-2000s, the next thing we saw coming and what's coming now is this change into GPS into smartphones, that this new category of higher-end smartphones, which are around running applications, drives a use case around LBS. How is the location going to be used to provide services now that we can provide applications on that platform? And there, the most important um, specification became active power, that every time the GPS receiver was turned on for use in an LBS mode, you had to make sure that the power consumption was, um, was reduced. So the active power of the, of the device became a very important specification um, that we were all fighting to, to improve. And from a secondary standpoint, we had to make sure the availability was improved. And this is where the multi-GNSS started to show up um, for, um, for using handsets for car navigation or for Google, Google Maps type implement, implementations in a smartphone in the urban canyon that became a big driver um, recently. What, what we see coming next is this idea that, that these wearables and IoT platforms are going to come up where they're not just doing LBS on demand because of an application, but they're going to need continuous location. It's going to need to be providing that capability all the time, but it's not necessarily going to be noticed by the user or activated by the user, so the specification that becomes important is kind of an energy per day. You want to make sure that your device can maintain its location without draining its battery. Um, and then we're also going to have to increase the availability of location into indoors to really fix this whole problem, and that will move us into this kind of hybrid capability. So if we look at those changes in the, in the market and think about how they're going to impact the, um, the GNSS architecture, so the first thing we want to look at is to see, well, where is GNSS? Um, this is a slide that, that I'm sure everybody has and is always hard to keep up to date that just looks at kind of the number of satellites coming from the different satellite constellations. I always wish that I could make this, I could have had a slide of this made in different years and see how far to the right this is pushed. But, but the important thing here is that we are really approaching this time frame where, where we're seeing a, a significant uptick in, in growth of satellites, again, to the kind of numbers of, of, of over 100 that really have an impact on if you're building a multi-GNSS receiver and you're going to have to deal with 100 satellites, how are you going to do that? So what we did was we looked at some particular scenarios um, around, in this particular case, so well, let's say we're trying to do an outdoor, um, so minus 130 dBm cold start test with an initial frequency uncertainty of around 1 ppm, right? And we, we wanted to look at what the impact of the different constellations would be on doing that in terms of what it takes inside a receiver to do that. So um, I'm not going to go into great detail on this um, here, 
Um, but but if you look at what 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 those impacts are, you can see that the difference between building a GPS receiver that can do this um, and building a Galileo receiver that can do this in this particular case, or from from the lowest one, I'm sorry, from the simplest one, which is GLONASS, to the most difficult one, which is Galileo, you see a 75x difference in kind of the number of correlators that would be required to do that, just based on the signal structure, um, which would indicate to you that, that maybe from a cold start time to first fix standpoint, you might prefer you know, a GLONASS implementation um, and, and do, do GPS um, um, or Galileo later. Because if you look at um, um, if you look at that that um, mm, that slide got out of order. Sorry. Um, if you look at that, then then what you would do is look at how those requirements got got implemented into those um, into those devices, and you you try to come down to these very low levels of power consumption around. A sufficient accuracy to support all these different applications and still be able to move this into a very small form factor. So, so, so then if we think about how that goes and we look at that relationship that goes on between the number of correlators that are required and um, to search out for, for each satellite, what you see is that there's, um, there's a big difference in the growth of those um, depending upon which constellation you look at. Um, and these were the parameters that we used um, to, to look at that particular, that particular element. Um, and what you found then is if you, if you then looked at a hot start test rather than a, than a cold start test at a weaker signal, which is the more common um, implementation in, um, in devices today, with with more with a better um, with a better starting condition because we have um, we have better information on on those um, oscillators and other uncertainties in in an integrated device and what we did was we normalized this to 160 millisecond search time so that if you look at the at rows um, four and five the coherent period and the number of incoherent dwells you always get 160. But we adjusted those based on what we thought was appropriate for each of those constellations. And now you look at what's required, you find that there's um that there's a very big there's a very big difference here. Now the difference between the the easiest one to do or the one that requires the least amount of hardware, which is Beto, to the one that requires the most in, in Galileo is only a six X difference. Um, and what that really says is it's not that different, right? It, you know, seventy five X is a big difference, six X is a much smaller difference. So, so this kind of drives our thinking around around implementation um, of of a full GNSS receiver that can support all the constellations. And it doesn't make a whole lot of difference um, which ones you use um, from a from a hardware standpoint. So, so then we go and look at what a typical GPS spec sheet looks like today, and think about whether those particular applications are important going forward. So I took a GPS receiver sheet from a, from a large manufacturer, and I just walked through the list and started crossing out in red the the um, the, the specifications that really aren't applicable in a mobile consumer device um, because of what we're trying to do. And what you see is that that there's quite a number of them that that kind of go away, um, in particular around unaided cold start type of applications. Um, and also around um, some of the particular accuracy requirements that um, are very important for car navigation and continuous operation, but, but they're not so um, important when you're trying to provide um, an indoor location capability for context um, in an application or on an IoT-like device. So, so we have some opportunity to make some, some changes in, in where we're going. Um, so... I also want to make sure I um, ha spend a little bit of time talking about how that impacts silicon. So, so what does that really mean to us um, in the silicon world? So what it really means is that the biggest, the biggest thing we need to worry about is standby power. Um, as we go to this all-day um, constant location application, 
then we have to really look at reducing standby power, and that means we need to look at SRAM because SRAMs are a horribly leaky component and create very large standby times, but they're what we've been using for years in the GPS world. We also have to look at non-continuous fix methods, right? So this idea of turning things on and off to save power, which relates back to the standby methodology. And then we also have to look at hybrids, right? So how are we going to support measurements from multiple radios like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth that are becoming important in indoor location? And how can we share those radios without just pasting them together? Um, and that involves integrating these onto, onto single die, looking at the interference problems that happen at the silicon level, and also what happens when you try to run multiple radios at the same time. So, so what we have to work with, especially here at Intel, is um, where the home of Gordon Moore and Moore's Law, is, 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 is that is our tool for trying to address these things. So if we look at um, where um, Moore's Law has gone um, and the fact that it's still working 30 years after it was first proposed, and we look at what's gone on recently, we, we see that we're still tracking to this, to this progression of constantly reducing device sizes um, and, and moving, moving forward. So, so we are already seeing um, these, are, these dates that are up here um, for, um, for the process technologies are associated with kind of digital processes. So um, we're certainly not um, down at the 22 nanometer level today on GPS receivers, but, those, but we will be moving there as we go. So, so what happens when you do that? Well, obviously when you move down that curve, you get this, this great increase in your ability to um, add more gates to improve TTFF and sensitivity. More correlators help you search more uncertainty faster. So it's been a great help to us um, in doing that. Um, and the other thing that it does is it allows us to, to run faster, right, to up the CPU clock speed, to do things like more advanced navigation algorithms, um, bring in more um, more satellites from multi-GNSS, run very extended Kalman filters, look at hybrid technologies, and then it also has driven down the power. So, so this active power requirement that we had was, was kind of coming along with Moore's Law um, without, without a whole lot of effort. But now we've run into the problem. Now the, the, t the technology has gone to where the parameter that we care about, which is standby power, is actually going up. So although we're getting benefit out of Moore's Law from speed and power, we're actually having a problem in the case that it, it's increasing our standby power, which makes it difficult to, to go to these lower fix rates with fast restarts. So, so what's happening is you're seeing a, 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 a trend where as you, um, as you move down in technology nodes, you're finding that the, the more advanced technology nodes are less applicable to the smaller multipurpose devices. So, so this is part of the reason why you don't see the, um, the mobile phone devices coming down as fast as you see the, the desktop devices coming towards those new technology nodes. So, so what does that end up doing for us, right? So, so that creates some, some really significant design challenges that we're trying to take advantage of. So we need to figure out a way to take advantage of Moore's Law and maintain these benefits of smaller geometry. We want the higher clock speeds. We need more memory for, and, um, for, for doing the multi-constellation methodology, and that gets us lower active power and smaller size. But we have to figure out a way to not give up our standby power when, uh, when, we, when we start moving down into these very, very small geometries. So that's going to require some new methodologies, both at the chip level in terms of how we build silicon, but also at the system design level in terms of how do we put these things together inside a mobile phone. Um, and I think that's part of what's driving the whole industry towards the kind of consolidation that we've seen, um, that, that, that standalone chipsets um, are a very not the only way to solve this problem, and without some access to the system design level, then then it's not a, we're not able to optimally um, solve this problem for mobile phones and IoT type devices. And then we're going to be looking at this trend that we all see coming of putting multiple radios onto a single die because that does further reduce cost and size when we try to start getting into watches. And uh, if you saw, like I said, if you were at CES and you saw the new, um, the new stuff, they're now talking about buttons. 
Um, we still have a, a ways to go to, to bring all that down, but bringing that down to that size in a, in a very sensitive GNSS radio is a difficult um, is a difficult problem. And once we start incorporating these different radios like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth into this solution, then we run back into this problem of, of the value chain of how do we get everybody aligned um, in a device that that has these different capabilities to produce a single unified um, a single unified solution. So, so I'll give you a little bit of a preview of what Intel is doing. I can't tell you too much about what we haven't done yet, but, but we look at this as a real opportunity for the strength of, of where Intel comes from. Um, we are, have the most advanced silicon processes in the world, we believe, and we are bringing those to bear on the location technology problem just starting in the last few years. So our goal is to provide a GNSS and location silicon solution with best-in-class performance based on, on Intel technology. So we're going to, and then once we've done that at the silicon level, we're going to look at bringing the platform level integration capability together. So we have the ability to merge multiple location technologies. Um, Intel CPU cores are prevalent today in all of these devices for both phones and tablets. So we have a platform level capability to integrate hardware and software for all these different capabilities to solve this indoor location problem and also to, um, to bring this to a variety of platforms. And we really believe that in order to, to execute to Intel's vision that we're going um, we're gonna to need to push this into a ubiquitous location technology that will be prevalent in all these devices so that we can improve the experience on these mobile products. One of the problems that I think a lot of us see with these mobile products is they have so many applications and they require a lot of interaction. And we'd all like these devices to become smarter and to understand and present the information that we want when we want it. And a big part of that is the location context. And so that's what we're planning on doing is integrating that location context into all of these platforms so that these smart connected devices can be even smarter and provide a better user experience. So I notice as I've been talking that uh, a number of questions have started uh, piling up. Um, so I'm going to um, end my presentation there, um, and um, I'll uh, work with Alan now and uh, answer some of the questions that have come up. So Alan, All right. where do you want to you wanna start? Well, it, wh why don't you catch your breath for a second there, Greg, and while you're doing so, I, I think you alluded to you've already seen via the back channel I've I've lined up uh, an assortment of questions. You can have a, pre have a private preview of them to yourself while I natter on for a minute or two here. Uh, okay. Thanks very much for that, for that excellent presentation. Um, I, one slide in particular struck me, the, the shifts in underlying platforms. That is the best three-minute summary of the past <laughs> 15 years of GNSS technology that that I have ever heard, and and I think it really it, it really helps me as a you know, sort of fringe technical slash non technical person to uh, really helps fall into place the the different uh, aspects and factors that the industry has been chasing first over here, then over there, then over there as the as the uh, applications. Right, and the and the main uh, volume platforms have, have shifted over the years. Certainly, we know that that P and Ds have have largely gone away or are going away. Uh, feature phones are are practically a thing of the past, although many people continue to have them and use them, and, and for for uh, for for good reasons, individual preferences. Smartphones are here now, but uh, even they may may soon cede their their place at the at the cutting edge to the the new wearable devices which are very much in in early adoption now but will yeah. uh will will change things and when you mentioned the buttons that you saw at CES I had not heard of that yet but I'm anxious to learn more I I I can't even conceive of what's going to happen when people well, start wearing buttons so I'll tell you, um, if you're interested, the, um, the, um, and, and I admit to being biased, but, um, but the Intel CEO, um, Brian Krasenich, gave a uh, keynote um, at CES, which 
Um, I, I believe you can see streamed on the CES website, and I believe it's also on the Intel. You can find it on the Intel website as well. Um, it's about an hour long, but 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 if you're a technical geek and you want to know what you know what what that looks like, then uh, then uh, sit through an hour of that and and be impressed about how much there is left to do. <laughs> oh um, boy. So, so let's um let's get started on these questions because some of them um I think are pretty interesting. Okay. Well, I'm going to kind of jump a little bit off your main topic uh, in the first set of questions, not completely sure. off, but take a few divergent ones. Uh one question is dual frequency expected to be seen in smartphones this year? So, it's interesting um if what you're saying there is L1, L2, L5, the answer is absolutely not. Um, you know, but if what you're saying is um, GPS, Galileo, Beto, then which are all in different bands, then I think we already are seeing um, we're seeing tri-band receivers already between the GPS band, the GLONASS band, and the Beto band. Um, and so I expect to see that continue from a multi-constellation standpoint rather than um, multi-frequency on individual constellations. All right. Now, I realize this next question gets a little bit outside your area of expertise or your principal <laughs> area of expertise, but antennas and receivers have got to go hand right. in hand in, into the future. Uh, right. From from your vantage point in receiver design, how, how do you see uh, antenna design uh, developing? Yeah. How are antenna design changes how are they changing and improving relative to receiver design? Well, well, the answer is, um, and if you go back to that slide that you like, uh, the answer is the opposite, right? Antenna design has been getting worse and worse um, uh, in order to, to shave cost and size, and it's being made up for um, in the silicon design. So, so what I would say, and a, you know, a really good example is, you know, most, most GPS receivers that we build for mobile phones aren't optimized to work at minus 130 dBm at kind of standard, normal, outdoor powers because we never see that. Um, the, if the, you know, the antennas that we typically work with are 8, 10, 12 dB down, so no matter what, we never see anything above minus 140. So, so I think the answer is the opposite. No one's trying in my market to make better antenna designs. They're trying to make them even smaller and even cheaper. Um, and especially if you think about getting into wearables and button size things, and how do you get an antenna that does, you need a GPS antenna, a Bluetooth antenna, and a Wi-Fi antenna in a button. That's the problem. Not, and not leaving room for, performance. Yeah, and still <laughs> leaving room for other stuff on that button. Right. So, yeah. And so basically we're being asked to make up for that in the, um, in the receiver design. Yeah. I, I remember a conversation that I had with you oh, some years back at a trade show and you had just come from some meeting with, uh, I think this, I'm sure this is when you were at SURF, and um, you had just come from a meeting with some, uh, a customer in which you'd done a bunch of negotiation about new technology improvements, and you, you had gone into the meeting very proud that you had uh, uh, <laughs> redu reduced yeah. I, I, either the size or the, or the cost right. of, of something, and they said, "Okay, great, we'll take that and subtract right. it from our bottom line." Now you, now you do the, now you do the next step in in sensitivity right. or time to first fix or whatever. So, so all your work it had not gone for naught, but basically you had right. to start right over again immediately. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that was, um, that was in that that was in that transition to the um, to the feature phone segment, right? If you think about it, even the PNDs in those days had real antennas. Um, but as soon as we tried to do 911 for feature phones, there was another 6 dB we had to go through because nobody was putting a patch antenna in a phone. Right, right. Well, uh, one of your slides showed that SBOS uh, showed GPS is 100% penetration, and SBOS right. was the next next greatest or next highest uh, bar on that chart, uh, outdated as it was, even though it's only or less than a year old. Uh, Right. Somebody, somebody wants to know what are the benefits of uh, of SBOS in a in a commercial. Uh, uh, yeah. So so the issue with receiver. the issue with SBOS is um, we we like we like geostationary satellites 
um, because you know they're they're easy um, they're easy to find and um, they're you know peop they're they're useful from a um, visibility standpoint. But but the data demodulation off those is very is even more challenging than GPS because of the additional coding schemes that go on top of it. So it's very difficult for us to demodulate data off the SBAS satellites. So we primarily use them for ranging um, and um, for autonomous operation um, when we're when we're not um, when we're not aided. But in in aided operation, we use them less because we get the data that we need off the internet, right? Off a, off a supple feed or it comes in some other way rather than from the satellite, which is much more useful. So, um, so, so the SPAS stuff is there because it's, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't add a lot of cost or um, difficulty to the receiver design, but it's not a crucial part of the operation anymore. Um, I'd say pretty much with the exception of QCSS, which has a large impact um, in, you know, in its regional operating area. All right. Let's let's continue the the trend in in these questions toward uh, toward multi constellations and uh, address the question: What's the common strategy to switch on? I realize this may not be quite as much of an issue in in a smartphone, or may be impossible in a smartphone. I, I'm not sure. But what's the strategy to switch on another GNSS constellation in case of a GPS problem for a future receiver? It it's a really good question, um, uh, but but it but it, it comes from a premise that 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 we would switch something on that was normally off. Um, the, the the general strategy that's being followed is to use everything that's available um, um, all the time, so that we can we can use the methodologies of of essentially autonomous RAIM um, in the receiver, where we now have eight, ten, twelve um, signals coming into the receiver. It's pretty obvious right away when something has gone wrong, um, and so it's not so much that we we can flag a time to switch on. It's more that we can see a time to switch off. If we yeah. can, if we see a sy systemic problem in multiple um, satellites or whatever, then then we may use that in our in our um, in our definition. But it's not from a switching on standpoint. So basically what we're doing is we're keeping everything on all the time and relying on um, autonomous RAIN capabilities from the fact that we're tracking 14 or 16 satellites at a time um, with all this extra compute horsepower because now I'm running, you know, I'm running embedded CPUs at hundreds of megahertz where like when we were back at SURF, if we could get a, you know, a 50 megahertz arm, we were happy. So we have a lot more compute horsepower in, on the mobile side to do autonomous RAIN. Yeah, so that issue is going to come up in well, as it did uh, earlier. I think it was early this year. Yeah, when when GLONASS suddenly, when half the right. GLONASS constellation suddenly went haywire, and high. Now this was for high grade survey receivers. Uh, survey users around the world, their, their receivers were all of a sudden either you know going going completely off or just uh, outputting a whole lot of erroneous solutions or saying, you know, I don't have the data that I need. Uh, right. And, and manufacturers very quickly had to tell their, their customers, oh, turn off. Uh, in, in those receivers, there was a way to, to turn off or ignore the GLONASS satellites. How that's going to sure. play out in terms of, uh, of much smaller receivers and much wider markets and much more uh, diverse and, and far-flung users, uh, I guess is a question to be dealt with in in the future. Yep. Um, now it may be hard to separate the these next two terms. But one one listener is asking, what's bringing more benefits to users in terms of receiver performance, multi constellation or multi frequency? Yeah. So I think I think I addressed that right. Multi constellation is far more beneficial in our market than multi frequency. We can't get to the accuracy levels that we that um, um, that are um, available to multi-frequency receivers because partially because of that antenna problem. In the sense that if we're if we're never tracking anything you know above minus 140 and we're normally operating more in minus 145, our ability to accurately demodulate code phase or carrier phase is pretty low. So. So we operate mostly in the code phase domain, so multi-frequency doesn't buy us very much. Um, 
and um, and any corrections that we need, we would get, like I said, from our connection to the internet, um, we would get we would get that way. So so we don't we don't get a lot of benefit out of multi frequency in these in these devices, but multi constellation from an availability standpoint, we do. Yeah, I just want to clarify. You're speaking from the perspective of mass market use. Yeah. Uh, the the question might be different for a high grade server, or the the answer to that Absolutely. question I'm, might be I'm different. Only speaking about mobile consumer devices. <laughs> right, right. Uh, now you alluded in uh, one of your slides to the advantages of Beidou in terms of uh, the number of correlators needed. Right. One listener wants wants to know, sort of more overall or more generally, how will Beidou change the way we think about GNSS, or or, or will it? Yeah, I, I, I guess my answer is um, um, I, I don't think it'll change things very much, right? It, it has certain advantages, um, you know, as a regional system today. Um, it has a lot of advantages in that region, um, and you know, you, the, I think from a, as a GNSS receiver designer, we look at Beto as another tool in the toolbox. So I don't think it makes a major change. We're adding it in. We're expecting it's going to be used. Um, and it's just, but it, it doesn't have any special characteristics that are going to create any um, any landslide change that that I can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, to to hone in on one uh, particular detail, uh, when you uh, when we say to achieve higher clock speeds, uh, is that something that's dependent on the GNSS industry in particular? Or is that being driven or controlled or waiting for advances in other technologies first? Well, so, um, you know, um, higher clock speeds is something we've all seen, right, even in the PCs we buy for our houses right now. We're buying, you know, you know, 4 gigahertz PCs, which we couldn't even imagine. Um, so, so I guess what I was really trying to allude to there is that there is even, I mean, although we don't need to go to that level, there is significant benefit in the GPS receivers from having higher clock speeds on the mobile devices. And a lot of that comes from this ability to manage the multi-constellation receiver, um, run these, these extended common filters and um, other you know, methodologies that are being used for indoor navigation where you're now not just combining, um, combining GPS, but you're combining Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and, um, you know, and sensors. The, the amount of horsepower that you need in order to effectively do that um, keeps growing. So we have a great use for this, um, but the, the clock speeds are generically increasing from Moore's Law as we would expect them, and we're taking advantage of that. Okay. You, you uh, mentioned in, in your uh, presentation, and, and this has been at the core of a lot of articles in GPS World Magazine, which are typically about research and development, uh, researchers are using software-defined GNS receivers a lot, or more and more, I should say. Uh, is there any aspect or vision in which a software-defined GNSS receiver will become popular in mass market applications, and, and if so, when? You know, that's a, that's a, um, that's a great question, um, because... Um, we've been, at least, I can say, in all the companies I've worked at, we, we are always looking at software-defined radios as a potential option. And every time you think that the next generation might actually be better suited for software-defined radios, some hardware improvement comes along that, that negates that. Um, and, and in the end, um, where we've kind of come to now with, you know, we're down in kind of, 20 nanometer type implementations, it absolutely helps the software defined radio concept, right? We've got so much more memory and so much more compute horsepower that, that we really could talk about doing that, um, you know, more, more efficiently than we used to be able to. But at the same to by the same token, the coding schemes that are coming down on these new satellites are becoming so complex that, that the hardware to do them um, is really necessary to ex to accelerate them from a from a power standpoint. That that because you can the coding schemes are known and because you can dedicate hardware to do them, they can do it much more efficiently. Even though the CPU horsepower is now available to do it, that wasn't. So um, so I think software defined radios still have a place 
Um, but but it's not it's it's not this generation, um, and and I'm not quite sure it's the next generation. You know, the the best way that I can imagine a software defined radio having the best use case is if there are six potential potential radios that you want to use, but you're not going to use all six of them at any one time. You only want to use you want to be able to pick the two that are most appropriate. Then a software defined radio is great because otherwise you have four sets of hardware sitting around doing nothing most of the time, um, which impacts kind of the silicon size. So the software-defined radio becomes really good if you're choosing from a larger subset. But at the moment, we're not choosing from a larger subset. We're, we're still do, using everything. Nobody's, you know, even from a location standpoint at the platform level, I don't use Wi-Fi all the time for location, but the Wi-Fi might be on for other reasons. So... So I can't optimize um, that kind of choice that would be most effective for a software-defined radio. So, so to me, that's the, the effectiveness of the software-defined radio is now that, oh, if I only, if I only had two RF chains, and I, and I could configure my RF chains, and I could configure my software chains to do two of any eight or ten, then a software-defined radio would be better. But, but I'm, not, I'm not there yet. That, that's not the market requirement yet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to lump together about half a dozen questions uh, into <laughs> one. Uh, a lot of people have asked uh, various aspects about Bluetooth and various things about inertial sensors, and I'd like you to just talk briefly about the the role going forward uh, in, in, say, a 2020, uh, year 2020, uh, multi-GNSS receiver how inertial sensors, how or if inertial sensors and Bluetooth are go are going to be folded into that mix. Okay, so I'm going to go backwards. I'll say from an inertial sensor standpoint, which we've had a lot more experience with to date, that at least to date the inertial sensor methodology of doing pedestrian dead reckoning in a smartphone, um, to me at least, has been a big disappointment. Um, and it's not, it's not a big surprise because, to me, the, the, the problem is not, it's not an inertial problem. It's a reference frame problem. Um, you know, the mobile phone has a constantly changing reference frame, and it makes inertial navigation incredibly difficult. It doesn't make it impossible. It just makes it difficult. Um, and so I haven't seen a whole lot of really good implementations um, of that coming all the way up to the consumer market. Um, but I think if you think about the IoT methodology and you think about, well, would there, is there a use for a button that, that contains the inertial sensors that's tied to the body frame that, that uses its display on the application, um, on this, you know, an application on a smartphone? Absolutely. Right? So, so, so I don't think that the platform, that the, I think the handset platform for inertial sensors is very challenging. But, but the growth of IoT is going to allow those sensors to be, to be in a place that's more suited to our navigation and just use the smartphone for, for, um, for the display. Um, on the Bluetooth side, I think it's, it's kind of the opposite, right, which is the, this whole idea of Bluetooth beaconing um, is becoming, is really uh, just growing, right, and we're seeing a lot of growth in it. In fact, at the CES show this year, the indoor application, the, the My CES guide, the, the the, the app that you download on your smartphone was Bluetooth enabled. Um, they hired a company to go in and put Bluetooth beacons throughout the entire show floor. Um, and so you could walk around and find your position on a map, on an indoor map that had all the booth names and numbers, um, and, and, and it worked really good from a location standpoint. It was very good at showing you where you were. It wasn't very good for navigation because it's proximity-based. So it doesn't have any indication of which direction you're moving or, you know, how far or how fast. And the, and the display was kind of jumpy, right, because it's a proximity-based methodology. So it really solved half the problem, but it didn't solve the other half. So now I could imagine the combination of those two being fabulous, right? Um, so, so I think, again, I think this in, part of the reason the indoor problem hasn't been solved is because it's a really hard problem. And the more things we can bring to bear the better the solution is going to be. So I think um, Bluetooth, as it gets deployed in a beaconing standpoint, is going to have a very large role to play. 
And I think inertials are going to benefit greatly from getting off the smartphone and onto IoT devices. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. However, we have a very enthusiastic audience still uh, <laughs> still live. So I'm going I'm to ask, ask you one more question. We'll run a, a couple of minutes over, uh, sure. well, depending on how long it takes you to answer this question. Uh, but I'm going to shift to a, a, a topic uh, propounded by uh, one of our, our other editors, uh, Eric Gackstetter, our survey editor, who's been very enthusiastic about this. In fact, uh, we gave him a award. I should not say we, but the okay. the voting uh, experts g- gave Eric an award for his columns on this topic, coming uh, stemming uh, quite a bit or inspired by research done by Todd Humphreys at the University of Texas uh, over the past several years. And the, the question is, mobile device design in your presentation, for the most part, focused on low-rate codes. What's the future of RTK-enabled mobile devices? Is is high rate codes are high rate codes necessary to achieve uh, centimeter accuracy? A parenthetical remark from me: Look at the February issue of GPS World magazine and the February webinar that we're going to have on February 19 for a really interesting. Uh, new new uh, approach to this, but but back back now to the question about uh, RTK enabled mobile devices. Are high rate codes necessary to achieve centimeter accuracy? And uh, and does what is the future, or does Intel have a future in high precision as well as in mass market? So. Um you know, in the consumer mobile devices, I really have a hard time coming up with, with a sufficient use case for centimeter level accuracy to justify what, again, what I believe would be the requirement for, 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 for fixing the antenna problem, right? That, that, that really is at the crux of my problem with RTK in a mobile device is not that I can't see a use case for it, but the use cases are limited. There's a lot more use cases for kind of one to three meter accuracy, which which we can achieve indoors using other other technologies. Um, but 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 the idea of doing centimeter level accuracy off RTK indoors is is really challenging. Um, so so but I do see a tremendous capability for that in the automotive market, right? The whole growth around autonomous cars and self-driving cars, you know, centimeter level accuracy, RTK-based receivers for automotive is absolutely going to become, going to become part of the solution for that problem as well. Um, and there we don't have an antenna problem, right? Um, so, so I think that the, the challenge is that in the mobile devices, there's still um, an antenna problem for, for RTK, and there's less, there's the, the number of applications that require centimeter level accuracy is much smaller than the number that require kind of three meter accuracy. Um, like I, the, the simple example I use for most, for most of these kind of things is um, I'm sitting here at the moment in a conference room, um, and I'm sure from a presence standpoint, it'd be really nice for my colleagues to know that I'm not sitting at my desk, so I'm not available to talk. I'm sitting in a conference room. I'm probably in a meeting that kind of one to three meter level accuracy is really important. Um, there are some applications where inside this conference room would be nice to know which chair I'm sitting in. Like if you were doing, um, if you wanted to do microphone beam forming type applications for video conferencing where you've got 20 people in a room. But, but you can see what I'm saying, the number of applications for that are much smaller rather than, rather than kind of just a generic presence application. So I think that that's the challenge is there's not a big enough use case to justify overcoming the barriers, um, especially for mobile devices to get down to the RTK level. Now the long code thing is a, is a separate thing. I think the long code thing for improving you know, code phase accuracies is, is already done. The, 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 the correlator architecture is necessary to support, um, support coding schemes like we see coming down the pipe is absolutely something we're going to be incorporating into into receivers going forward. Um, but the centimeter level carrier phase based stuff might might not make it. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to wind up the webinar. And thanks very much, Greg Turetsky, for this fascinating look at the 
future of receiver design and the future of uh, of many other things as well, uh, oh, associated, of course, with receiver design. I want to thank all of our listeners for joining in, and if you found this webinar profitable, you will be able to share it with your colleagues fairly shortly. I think within about a week, we will have a downloadable form of this webinar uh, in a link so that you can forward it to your colleagues. They'll, they'll have to register in some sense, but, but this, this is a portable webinar in that sense that uh, it can be viewed and consumed by, by a, an even wider uh, audience. So uh, be aware that in another week it will be available. I think I'm also going to get a transcript done of it so that we can present it in print form, either in print print in the magazine or in one of our newsletters as well. And, and if uh, Greg's time and mine permitting, we will uh, try to address some of the questions that came in that we were not able to address live on the air. Uh, thanks again to Greg Turetsky. Thanks to NAVCOM, our sponsor. Thanks to you, our listeners. And remember, coming up next month on the third Thursday of the month, which is our uh, preferred date, February 19, we will have a look at the future of GNSS antenna design. And one of the topics we, that will be addressed will be accuracy in the palm of your hand, centimeter positioning, with a smartphone quality GNSS antenna. This is not the future. This is something that is that is being done now, at least in uh, at least in the University of Texas lab. But it's being done with existing equipment. I, it's a fascinating topic. It's going to be our February cover story, and we'll look at it in some detail in next February's webinar. Thanks and again, Greg. Nothing, Thanks. I was saying nothing I like more than being proved wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Well. The, it's still in the lab, but but we'll see. And and as you say, the applications for it may be limited, and 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 we'll we'll just find out. There there's that's the great thing about scientific inquiry. You, you don't know anything yep. until you go looking and trying to find out and digging a little bit more. Uh, thanks good. again to NAVCOM. Thanks Greg. Thanks Allison. Thanks to you, our listeners, and we'll see you next month. Bye now. Thank you for attending the landscape that we for attending the receiver design for the future webinar. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the gpsworld.com website and will be emailed to you one day from today. Please visit the GPS World website to register for next month's webinar, Accuracy in the Palm of Your Hand, on February 19th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for attending and have a nice afternoon.